My name is Ben Robb. Um, today we'll be uh, talking through some of the options in uh, SharePoint and Office 365 for uh, really driving through management decisions based on facts, based on information that you hold within your organizations already, and using that to make better decisions um, through self-service business intelligence. Um, I'm Ben Robb. I, uh, been a SharePoint MVP now for eight years, something like that, eight or nine years. Um, uh, started off in the, uh, in the MCMS world um, and then moved uh, as, as SharePoint and CMS became one product, moved more into SharePoint and then uh, you know, been, been in that space ever since. Um, I currently, for my day job, I work as a senior manager uh, in the, the enterprise collaboration team for um, a global professional services company. So uh, I mainly focus on internal um, line of business applications. Don't do, don't do too much client-facing work. Um, I'm also the co-organizer of the London SharePoint user group, which meets about every two weeks if, uh, if you're not aware of that. So today we're going to talk about you know, what is data-driven decision management and how is that manifest itself within an organization. Talk a bit about Microsoft's vision for self-service business intelligence. Look at the tool set that exists right now um, and how you can use those um, tools to, to their best advantage to deliver um, you know, on, on business, business value. And then really looking at some of the challenges, some of the areas that you need to think about as you're starting to embed business intelligence within your organization. So yeah, this is a business track, not going to, going to be doing any coding or any, you know, uh, anything to do with setting up um, the business intelligence features. This is more uh, about what it can do, the art of the possible around that. So starting off with management decisions, the sorts of management decisions that get made every day in organizations um, are things like, you know, what, what customers should I be focusing on? What, what sales lines should, should I invest in so that um, you know, I can grow my company? What parts of my business are underperforming? What internal projects am I doing that are not delivering the value that they need to or delivering on time um, and, and so on? A lot of these decisions are made in most organizations by a little bit of data, but not very much, and a little bit of, uh, and, and a lot of sort of gut feeling and experience and knowledge of the leaders within an organization. But increasingly, people are finding that that's, that's not good enough because competitors are using more structured, more predictable ways of looking at making those decisions. And so really being able to focus in on uh, you know, what, what it is that, that is going to drive revenue, drive uh, the business towards uh, you know, your targets, your goals. The other major issue that, that occurs is that in almost all cases, you have intrinsic biases based on not you know, what, what the facts should be presenting you, but more about how we, how we perceive things, how we uh, make those decisions based on information that we've, you know, historical context, uh, information from other, other um, businesses, previous, previous lives, and that's going to affect the decision-making process that, that the business, uh, that, that business leaders have within, within your organizations. So fundamentally, decision making is moving from a very much a sort of gut feeling, gut, in, gut instinct way of, uh, of, of making those decisions into much more of a fact driven um, way, way, of, way of doing that. So with all that in mind, 
there's a number of different ways that we can really drive through um, the, the, uh, the decisions that, that we're, we're going to be making. Basing your management decisions on some firm foundations of business analytics is really the bedrock of being able to deliver real value um, to your leaders, timely information when they need it for those decisions. So they can really use, use those, that information at the point that they need that within their, within their uh, processing. Every organization has lots of data um, and increasing amounts of data that's locked away in silos, whether that's a line of business application, um, whether that's a SharePoint site, whether that's you know, email or you know, other, uh, other, informations, uh, other information that could be brought to bear to make decisions. In, in, in most places, in most organizations I've, I've worked with, that information is locked away. It's very difficult to find. So the first thing you need to be thinking about as you start down the, the road of identifying the, um, the information that you need is having a strategy to extract that data from those silos. Not necessarily move it, but at least make that available within your organization. In most organizations, in most data contexts, you're going to need to do some validation and some deduplication and some, um, some, some fixing up of the, the data. In every business intelligence project I've ever worked with, the difficulty has not been getting the, right da getting the data um, and playing with that data to deliver a report, to, d to deliver something that's going to drive um, <coughs> leaders to make the right decisions. It's been about being sure that that data is actually accurate enough and, uh, and, and doesn't have any issues from a, um, from a vid validity perspective. There's also a lot of, of duplication of data within organizations. Most organizations have multiple places where customer lists are, where product lines are, where you know, services that uh, your, your organization offers uh, are kept. And in many cases, those are not consistent. They're not, there's no referential integrity between those uh, different sources. So you're going to have to think about how you merge all of those data sources into a single view of that and make that consistent. Because once you've got consistent data within uh, your data models, that then means you can compare information from multiple sources. So thinking through some examples where that might be useful, you might have line of business application data for um, the, the sales that your, your company make to, um, to, to clients around the world. And different divisions within your company might record that data in different ways. But in many cases, it might be, you know, it, it might be exactly the same service or product that you're selling between those uh, different places. So, you know, a, your UK subsidiary records that in a slightly different way with maybe different product numbers. Your, um, you know, your French subsidiary re records it in a different way. And so it's very dif difficult to then get that holistic view of your entire data set um, because you can't uh, match data between those different data sets. And then simplifying the data is um, important to really drill down into the information that, that is actually relevant to the questions that you're asking. Um, you know, it's, in many cases, data, the data that you're, you've got within your organization is very noisy. It has lots of information around um, you know, subsidiary information, which is not, not relevant to what you're trying to achieve. So being able to simplify that data is key to, to the success of you know, building your business and analytics framework. And then having a process to visualize that data, um, to, to actually get that in the hands of the people that they need. And regardless of what tool we're talking about, you know, we could be talking about um, ClickView or Tableau or um, you know, 
SAP HANA or you know, any of the platforms out there, or 365, any of the platforms out there, you're going to have to, as you think about business analytics, you're going to have to think through you know, each of these stages in the, in the process and get that done. And so looking at that in a slightly different way, the sort of core requirements that you're going to see as you talk to the business about what they need BI to be doing for them often are phrased in this kind of language. You know, we need to be able to do this ourselves. We don't want to have to go and call a developer up and spin up a project to to give us the uh, report that we want. We want maybe not our business leaders, but certainly mid-managers and business analysts within the organization to be able to drive that um, going forward. So it needs to be on demand. It needs to be available from anywhere, any place. And it needs to be easy to use. And traditionally, BI tools have not been easy to use. So I think you know, this is where some of the new products that are coming on the market now and in the last few years really moved the ball forward and made self-service business intelligence a, a reality where it wasn't before. From a, so that's, that's a sort of user perspective of what's required for BI. From an enterprise, from a corporate perspective, they really need to be sure that it's aligning to the global standards that your organization has. Um, you need to be able to be sure that that data that, that is being processed is valid, it's, it's correct, um, and is of high quality. And you also need to understand how it's going to scale within the enterprise. So if you, if you have something that's you know, just a small team within the organization, that's, that's one set of uh, requirements, but is that is the, is the platform that you choose to deliver to uh, going to scale as you start growing, uh, growing that capability within the organization? And then from a, from a sort of business requirement um, perspective, the, you know, what are the leaders looking for from this? Ultimately, they're looking to be able to both understand the status quo of the the, the, the particular area that, that is being looked at, but also use that data in order to predict um, you know, what's going to come next. And I'm not really going to talk too much about the prediction side because that's, um, that's really not self-service. For that, you really need to invest in data scientists and get, get some value um, f through, through that. But, Microsoft, for example, has some very sophisticated tooling uh, that's coming on stream in the Azure platform with machine learning to be able to answer really interesting questions like, um, when I have a group of um, customers that all, are all using services or buying products from my, my company, what products Am I not selling in what regions to which customers? Where's the white space between uh, the, for, for that? So how can I then use that to drive revenue, to drive sales of those, of those products? Or from an HR perspective, based on a lot of information that's gathered during the recruitment, recruitment phase, can I predict which of those candidates are likely to still be working in the organization in a year's time. So I, I know not my organization, but there are, I know of organizations that actually build that into their recruiting process um, to, to gather a lot of information, use machine learning algorithms to, to really drive through that. So broadly, it needs to be Accurate, you need to be sure that the data is right, otherwise it's useless. Contextual, it needs to be answering the right questions at the, at the right time within the, the, the cycle that you're, you're looking at, and it needs to be usable.
So looking at the, the sort of key audiences that we, we think about, self-service BI is really going to be driven by business analysts, mid-management, maybe EAs. They're going to be doing the day-to-day -day work. They need the ability to create your business intelligence dashboards, your reports, your, 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 um, your information that's then going to be consumed by leaders within your organization. I think, you know, you talk to, you talk to some of the vendors, you talk to Microsoft around their vision, their strategy for self-service business intelligence, and they're, they're still thinking that, you know, leaders are going to fire up Excel, connect to random data sources, bring that through, um, and create reports on the fly. Um, I think it's very unlikely, certainly the leaders I know, will not be doing that. They're going to get mid-management, they're going to get um, their EAs, their, um, their business analysts to do that work. But they don't want to have developers necessarily having to create those. You know, when, when a particular report needs a new field or a particular um, dashboard needs a new box with different data in it, they don't want to have to go back to developers, which was the problem in the past. So the moment you, do, the moment you have to go through that, you're stuck in the land of corporate BI, which is very, very structured, very focused, very slow to change, and not really ad hoc. And then in the, far, in the far right, when we start talking about advanced analytics, you need really specialized teams. So if you're thinking about, do I have the right people in the organization in order to do business intelligence, you almost certainly have the right people within your organization at some level to do the self-service BI. They may need a little bit of training. They may need some guidance to get that done. But you probably don't have to go and recruit specialist skill sets. From a corporate BI perspective, um, if you've got those resources be because of historical reasons, then you, know, you can still have that. But I see increasingly stuff that used to be delivered through um, corporate BI, things like project cost reporting, sales forecasting, that kind of thing, that's no longer being developed um, as applications or being built in you know, report, SQL Server reporting services or you know, other platforms like that. It's increasingly developers and IT are making data sources available for use by the self-service BI audience. And then if you're of a certain size and you have a certain complexity of business, and you have a business that warrants um, this sort of more advanced analytics, that's really where you need to start specializing. You need to have specialist teams with data scientists. Um, and that can be very valuable. But you know, if you haven't started down the journey of getting self-service BI, you're probably not quite ready to, to start thinking about some of the, the advanced stuff. So looking at the tool set, um, some of these have been around for a very long time. Obviously, Excel, um, reporting services and analysis services, um, they still remain. They're still very useful and valuable to the organization. And they're probably where your existing reporting is being done right now. Um, almost, almost all the reporting that's been done now is done in Excel. In most cases, that's actually been done by someone cutting and pasting content into Excel and then using that to generate reports that they then publish in PowerPoint. I guess that could be considered to be self-service BI, but it's not particularly, it's not really what we're looking at. Something that's recently um, becoming available, it's, uh, there's a public preview available right now, is Power BI. Um, and I, I'll show you um, how that works and, and the sort of differences that Power BI brings to the table that you can't really get in, um, in Excel, Excel services, and SharePoint. Um, and then machine learning is where 
if you're doing really advanced analytics, you, you can start using that to start modeling your, um, modeling your uh, analysis and automating that analysis. So instead of, uh, instead of someone really having to understand how to build a report, you can build that process through machine learning and out, out the other end get, get a whole host of information. So concentrating on Excel, because I'm guessing that everyone in the room has used Excel, um, there's a number of tool sets within Excel that are going to help go through the process of different, um, uh, different parts of the BI process. So if we think about some of the things we saw earlier in our process, we need to integrate and cleanse data to bring it in so that we're able to to get the information in a single place where we can then start using it to uh, deliver, deliver the reports that we need. We need to be able to model um, and then potentially enrich, so bringing in data from multiple sources into a single place. In the past, you really had to do, do that in something like SSAS. You had to build a cube that was a pretty complex operation. Um, to build up that data warehouse. Um, but Excel now gives you tooling which allows you to do that within Excel without having to uh, do, do that uh, in another tool. Obviously, you need to visualize, and Excel for, forever really has, has had good visualization tools with its charting, with its um, smart art, and things like that. You need to be able to query and filter and drive um, the experience so that you can really drill down into the information that you need. And then you need to be able to share that with your colleagues, with your leaders. Um, far too many things are locked away in um, Excel spreadsheets on people's desktops. How do, we, how do we use Excel and Excel services to be able to deliver the sharing capability that we want, which doesn't just mean emailing the, the Excel file to your colleagues, which actually it often does. So just re-walking around that with the different tooling, um, you've got Power Query doing the um, integration and cleanse, cleansing operations. And I'll show all of these um, when, I, when I get to a demo in a bit. Um, but these are the sort of key parts of the product set that, that are going to do each one of these things. The modeling in, and enriching is in, is in Power Pivot. The visualization is in power view, power map, power pivot tables, power, power uh, pivot charts, and things like pivot tables and pivot charts. Um, from a query perspective, you've got all the filtering capabilities that have been in, in Excel pivot tables and, uh, and charts and slices and so on for the last few versions. Um, but you've also got. Um, some more sophisticated ways in Power BI, particularly through the Q&A capabilities, uh, to be able to query in a natural language form to, to get that done. Sorry. Um, have you seen much uptake up from the cleansing and integration perspective, uh, uptake in the use of master data services uh, and data quality services? That there are some. Um, we, we have... We have made use, use of it in my organization. Um, it's not widely used. I, I think what tends to happen is historical data sets are already in some service that's available. In, in some cases, that might be you know, uh, a, a, a web service or a no data feed that, that's been provided by another tool, a line of business application, or a um, or, or a, another team within your organization that's responsible for that data. Um, in our organization, we have an um, enterprise service bus that manages the communication between all the systems. Um, and we also have uh, cubes, lots of cubes in our organization that are then exposed um, and available for use, and, and we can connect to, to those cubes directly. W what we're finding is in... In many cases, as we start doing projects with business intelligence, um, that's when we start finding the problems with the data. 
and you know what from a initial viewpoint was a couple of weeks to build a couple of reports extends and extends and extends because the reports are done very easily very quickly but as soon as the business users see that see those reports they say but the data is all wrong and that's that's a, a, a big lesson to, to learn that as you as you start exposing all of this business data to leaders they're going to find that their business data is not quite as clean as they thought it was. I mean, is it a valid concern then to say that if you're not cleansing that data at the lowest level, uh, such as the things I've mentioned, then although you can do a lot of that at the up upper layer here in Excel, um, wouldn't there be a lot of duplication? Yes, abso absolutely. So you, you do want to, if possible, cleanse at source, always. Um, but in many cases, you, you might have a conversation where the team that's responsible for cleaning that needs several months, so you have a stopgap solution. Um, yeah. So then, from a um, sharing perspective, obviously, Power BI is one way to share, but also uh, making use of business intelligence sites in, um, in SharePoint. SharePoint on-prem or SharePoint, um, uh, SharePoint in, in Office 365. Or being able to just embed that, that data, build up those, those reports, those dashboards, as um, Excel files and then just render them through Excel services directly on, uh, on, the, uh, on a SharePoint team site or you know, any other SharePoint deployment. So the key thing that we want to make sure that we're doing as we think about how we're going to build business intelligence into our process is really thinking about being able to have any device consume that data in a form that's optimal for them, be able to do that from anywhere, so not, not be restricted about um, having, to, having to have that data on your local laptop, on your local PC. Um, or in a network share or whatever, and be able to do that at any time. And, you know, that's those three sort of tenants about empowering your users. I'm, I'm talking about this in the context of Microsoft's approach to delivering self-service BI, but that's true across the whole of Office 365's uh, Roadmap. That's true across, in fact, the whole of Microsoft's roadmap. So you look at um, you look at the Azure roadmaps. You look at the uh, the, the Office client, the Office uh, the Office 365 roadmaps. They're all talking about any device, anywhere, anytime. Okay, so let's see some of this in in action. And let me just multiple monitors. Oh, you know what? There we go. Okay, so what I've got here is a simple Excel file. Um, it's got a, at the, on this sheet, it's got a pivot table and a slicer all out of the box. And where I'm getting this data from is not locally within uh, Excel. Where I'm actually getting this data from is uh, an OData feed that's been published on the Azure uh, marketplace. Um, but in doing that, you know, I'm... I'm using an, as, as an example a freely available data source. You would be using data sources that you, you support and run internally, and maybe augmenting that, that merge conversation that we talked about earlier. Um, you may be augmenting that with, with other, other data, so um, information that's publicly available about, uh, about all sorts of things, about um, countries, about demographics, about other things, and using that to 
build build in your um, build into your reports in a in a mashup. So what I've done is I've clicked on the data tab in um, in Excel, and I've gone to external get external data, and what that gives me is a whole different set of uh, of options. And there's some there's some pretty cool ones. There's um, you know, from access. There are still a lot of um, it, pieces of information stored within Access in, in organizations, even though you know, we've tried for the last 10 years to stop that. We can grab information directly from websites. So I, I don't know if any of you were in Christina, I think it was Christina's session uh, earlier in the week. She had a very cool demo where she clicked on that button, went to Wikipedia, and dragged data out of a table that was stored, uh, that was presented through Wikipedia. So it doesn't have to be structured data. Obviously, it still needs to have a pretty good data structure. From text, um, does what, what it says on the tin, that's really bringing in a CSV file or whatever. But if I click on this, I get a whole wealth of other ones. So I can connect to SQL Server, SSAS, um, both uh, uh, so I can, I can connect to a cube and bring in that data model directly. Um, I can connect to the Azure marketplace, which is what I've, what I've connected to here. I can call an OData feed. Um, so you know, that, in, that makes some interesting capabilities possible. For example, all of SharePoint, or pretty much all of SharePoint now has OData compliant feed. So if you have a list in SharePoint, you want to use that within the context of a data model in your, in your world, uh, in, in Excel, you can easily connect to that SharePoint list and drag that through um, OData feeds. And there's a few other uh, options here. So for those of you who haven't seen the um, Azure Marketplace, there's a ton of data available, um, and some of, it's, some of it's really high quality and some of it less so. But you, know, you can look at, I'm just going to click on a few randomly, you know, the average house price by, by borough um, published by the GLA. You might have you know, some, some requirement that needs that kind of data. It's well worth having a look and seeing if there's publicly available data. Some of it's free, some of it's not free, um, but none of it's very expensive. So, so, taking off the free filter, there's a whole bunch here. And when you make use of that, um, you, yeah, so this one, 300 pounds, 340 pounds a month, um, you can buy that and then you get a special key that um, you, you put in to, to, to your data model, to your data connection. And what that does is um, uh, tracks from a uh, transaction perspective and whether or not you've bought that uh, access to that data. And so once you've got the data, whether that's from within your organization or external or um, some, some other data source that, that you're connecting to, you can then make use of that within um, Power Pivot and build up your data models. So in this case, what I've got here is all the raw data that's been used to drive the reports that you're seeing in the, in the Excel file. So there's an area tab, there's a, um, a year, and so on. And you know, this data model's pretty trivial. There's what is it, 900 rows, five or six columns. In most cases, you would have multiple, um, multiple tables of data that you're connecting through relationships. And you can build all of that within the diagram view to be able to connect um, different data sources together uh, and provide that instant, instant sort of way of reviewing and viewing that, um, that, that, that process. You can also add calculated fields and formatting to the data model so you don't have to do it as you're consuming that. So if I just go out of that. So what I have here is 
um, a simple pivot table. So if I just click into that, you get the pivot table fields on, on the left hand on the right hand side. And you know, getting to this kind of level of detail was why I said you're not going to get leaders in most organizations to be going to this kind of level of detail. What you're going to get is um, business analysts, um, potentially executive assistants, maybe mid-management coming in and building up these reports like this. Um, so from here, we have some slices, so I can do some filtering uh, on that data. And then in another view, I've got some chart data that I might want to uh, present. And I can, again, I can use the standard Excel filtering capabilities to, uh, to provide that, that, that view. And then in addition to that, what I have here is PowerView, which is a much richer design surface for building, building out dashboards and reports. And if I, if I just show you how that's, um, if I just delete this, actually. So, you know, I can start building up my, I can start building up my report and I can say, actually, I want that to be, um, I don't know, an average or something like that. And I want some filters over here. And that's, that's now a much richer interface for um, my, my users to start looking at. And I can, you know, I, I'm looking at pretty static data from a, you know, it's textual data, maybe some uh, number columns. But you can also uh, make use of other ways of visualizing that data. So if I had a lot of data about um, about places um, with GPS coordinates. Interesting. Um, I, I, could, I could make use of maps um, and bar charts and other, other stuff like that. Um, I can provide that data as like a table here, um, or I can make it uh, tile-based so I can, uh, I can flip through um, the, the tiles. So there's, there's quite a few options in PowerView to, to design quite compelling um, interfaces that, that work, work well um, when displayed in, in, uh, in, a, in a browser. Now, when you're thinking about sharing that information with, with your organization and you want to put that up into um, Excel services, you want, you want to uh, you want that data, you don't want to have to open this file every time to update the data, you want it automatically to, to just update based on the data sources. Um, you want to be able to visualize that very easily within, within, your, um, within the context of your sites. In, um, in SharePoint 2013 on-prem, that the PowerView sheets require you to use um, Silverlight. And that is a massive hole in the product, uh, in my view. The reason is, I don't know what your organizations are, are about, but certainly in my organization, that's, that's, that's not really acceptable to my senior leaders. H how many people have senior leaders who now work mostly with iPads? Yeah. None of them will be able to see reports built in PowerView if you're hosting this on-prem. Now, if you go to Office 365, there is an option um, that's currently in preview or beta mode, um, which is uh, an HTML5 rendition of PowerView. So it's coming. Whether that's ever going to come back down to, Office, uh, to SharePoint 2013 on-prem, I don't know. I've not heard any any answers either way, and I've asked a few times. Um, yeah, so, so think about when you're deciding how you want to visualize um, your reports, your dashboards, think about where it's going to be consumed going forward. So then, when you do actually want to view that report, um, you can then use Excel web applications, uh, sorry, Excel web apps to 
drop those as web parts on your page. So in here, what I've done is I've dropped a, um, that same spreadsheet we were just looking at in as a web part um, on, onto an existing page. And I get all of that capability that we had in the Excel client, except it's obviously timed out. So I get my slicers working, I get my pivot table filters all working, um, and I can clear that filter and so on. And I get my, um, I get my charts appearing, as you can see here, um, and I get my power view view if my mouse was working or not. I should get my power view view. It's assuming the internet's not died again. Okay, there we go. And what you'll see here is, because this is running in 365, I get the try the new HTML5 rendition of, of this. So how did I get this to appear in this location? There's a couple of things that I needed to do, but the most important was in, in my info pane in Excel, I have a browser view options. Now, if you're using 2010, that wasn't so obvious. It was, I can't remember exactly which tab it was, but it was buried way, way down in the interface. It wasn't nice and obvious like this. There was still a, a, a button, but it was you know, about that size on the right-hand side. It's much more obvious. And what we can see here is um, you can choose whether or not you want to expose the whole um, workbook to, to Office, uh, to, to, to the SharePoint rendition, to the Excel services rendition, or you can say, I just want these individual sheets, or I want these named items within my, within my site. So if, that's, if those na named items are you know, charts or pivot tables or whatever, I can only expose those and therefore protect the calculations and the, the data model and all sorts of other things from being seen which is often a requirement. And then if I, have, if I want to be able to pass parameters in, that slicer that I had on the pivot table, um, I can add that as a parameter to my, um, to my site, uh, to, to my sheet, and then when I publish that within, within my team site, I can then use filters like you know, standard out-of-the-box SharePoint filters like the text filter, um, the, the list filter, the, the query string filter, and so on. So if I edit the page, if I edit the page and, and just go to add, add a new web part, I can make use of any of these filters and then bind that to my Excel web access view. So, you know, for example, I can have a query string. And that allows us to build integrated, connected dashboards to my, um, to, to, to my, uh, to, to my view, view, viewpoint here. So that's pretty much one of what I wanted to show you on Excel Web Access, Excel Web Services. You do get a whole bunch of different ways of making use of that. Ranging from, ranging from being able to see everything in context and it still looks like Excel, um, being able to just, just reference an individual named item and just get that uh, piece, or I can also decide you know, what kind of toolbars I want. Do I want to allow the open in Excel, download, download a snapshot, refresh selected connection, refresh all the connections. So do I want to be able to hit a button and refresh that data back to the original data source? Do I want to have all my calculations run when I open this? Do I want um, uh, and a drop-down list so I can flip between different, um, different named items? And then interactivity with that. You know, do I want to be able to modify parameters? 
do I want to do I want people to be able to do sorting and filtering and do I want all my pivot table capabilities enabled in this view so this web part gives you a lot of power and enables you to build quite sophisticated um, quite sophisticated things here in addition to that the The parameter that I showed you on the, on the view here, the slicer parameter, you can access that parameter. You can obviously use those filters I talked about. But you can also, or you can get developers to write um, JavaScript files to on the fly update those. So if you want to build an interface around that Excel web access view, and you want to provide some buttons and maybe some menu options and, and you want to use that to build a, a rich interface, you can do that. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's useful to do that, uh, it, particularly if you're limited to on-prem. Because um, if you're going to... Um, interesting. Yeah, if, you, if you're going to be um, going... To, if you're using the cloud to be doing this, I would strongly advise you seriously look at Power BI. So Power BI has a slightly different way of building this, these, these reports. And this is an example of a Power, Power BI um, report using the, the public preview. And again, what you can see here is I have a very similar list of, well, I have some similar lists of uh, data sources that I can bind to Power BI and use that to really build up my dashboards. I can obviously connect to Excel. Um, I can connect to SQL Server Analysis Services, so SSAS is available. But I also get you know, all sorts of other uh, data sources here. Um, and I can add other data sources as required. And what that allows us to do is build up these really rich interfaces that are a mashup of lots of different data sources and make it a much richer experience for, 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 for the end user. So if they wanted to move stuff around, you know, it's like picking up um, items from a, uh, on, a, on a mobile device, on a tablet um, device, and being able to arrange your home screen um, your dashboard report in, in a way that's relevant and works for you um, as you're consuming that data. And so what you see is lots of different ways of looking at data from charting to you know, big numbers, big high-level numbers, um, to, uh, to, to graphs and different types of, of graphs. And... Uh, in, it, in addition to that, you, you've also got uh, all the mapping capabilities that you see here, so you can really drill down right through into, um, into the data source and, and, and visualize that in ways that's going to make sense to, um, to your business, business users. And when you do that, the other thing that you find is you're then able to you know, look, at, look at that data in more detail and drill down and... Um, I'm sorry, my mouse is really killing me. Yet, yeah, um, be able to drill down, and also to apply filters based on um, interactions that you're having here. So I can, I can click on, you know, a single item here, and then, you know, drill down and change the renditions um, based on, based on whatever I've selected in whichever view that I'm looking at. And that's going to impact the entire dashboard and redraw all of those um, visualizations that, that are useful for, for people. So the other thing uh, that Power BI gives us um, is the querying, the, the, the Q&A capabilities that uh, we saw, uh, we talked about earlier as being you know, one, of the, one of the sort of main ways that we want to expose this data is 
enable people to be able to ask interesting questions from the data without necessarily having to understand um, the data model, uh, the underlying data sets that, that you've got, but be able to use natural language to, do, to, to, to provide that. So you know, if I ask a question in here like, um, you know, what were the sales per square feet as an example? And it instantly translates that into a format that it, it understands and then gives me the answer. If I wanted to say what, were the, what, was, what was the gross margin last year, last February, uh, maybe I don't have data for last, uh, last March. There we go. So, you know, being able to ask data, uh, ask questions of that data in a way that uh, is not really needing to you know, either click on lots of things or um, or, or provide another uh, or really have deep understanding of the underlying data model is really going to give quite a lot of power to people who who have made the effort to build this kind of interface in Power BI. And then if you think about the way that people are starting to interact with um, computers, they're no longer having to spend a lot of time typing um, to ask questions. You know, how many people in the room have Siri or Cortana uh, on, their, on their phones? And how many people now, instead of opening their search app, typing out the search um, term that they want, they now just ask the question and expect to get an answer. This kind of interface, if you think about um, the natural language query stuff that you're getting here, plus voice activation, that's going to be a game changer for how people consume information and data within their organizations. You know, if, you can, if you could hook this up to Siri or Cortana, and I haven't heard any specifics on this, but it would not surprise me in the least if that's where they're going with this. Um, that's going to be quite compelling, I think, going forward. Okay, so just wanted to... Just conscious... We're pretty, pretty much at the end of the... So I just wanted to spend the last couple of minutes um, really talking about some of the challenges and some of the processes you're going to have to think about in order to get this delivered within your organization. And a lot of these are, you know, it doesn't matter what technology program you're running, you're going to have to do these. These are not specific to BI. But in terms of being able to deliver this to your business, you really need to make sure they're aligning to your enterprise goals so as your business is saying, um, we have these goals, you need to be starting to think, so if we have these goals, do we have the data to be able to identify whether or not we're hitting those goals and those tasks, uh, the, the, those, those measures? Can we measure it? Can we, um, can we quantify it? And can we use that data in order to make decisions about meeting those enterprise goals? So, Find some, find some low-hanging fruit around, around the enterprise goals. Make sure once you've done that, you're asking the right questions of the data. And once you know what those questions are, again, go back and look at the data that you have and make sure that that data exists in your organization, that you're capturing it, capturing it in a format that's going to be something you can use. And then make sure you understand when, when you've been done all this work and you've, you've created your data models and your visualizations and you've shared it with your leaders, are they actually making use of that data in order to make the decisions that are going to drive the strategy for your business going forward? And if they're not, understand why not. And it's probably because either you weren't asking the right questions and you didn't really understand the enterprise goals 
or you're not delivering the data in a compelling way that's going to make sense to the, the leaders that you're trying to Im influence. We've talked about a, a lot of these barriers already. Data quality is just crucial. Without confidence in the data, no one's going to have confidence in the reports, and nor should they. Data access is an interesting one. Because traditionally, data has been locked away and locked down, uh, it, it's sometimes very difficult to actually f get physical access to that data in order to make use of that data in your BI tooling. And then the flip side of gaining access to that data is what impact on governance models, on compliance, and um, in some industries, in, in your, uh, in your legal, legal responsibilities and data residency uh, responsibilities. So how does all of that... Um, Get, get addressed as part of your, your process. And then from a skills and culture perspective, you've got to, like, like with any application, you've got to find ways to make people want to use the solutions that, and the, the data that you're, you're providing and that they have the necessary skills to um, actually deliver the reports. So generally, as you're asking those questions, as you're trying to get that data quality up, you need to be finding the holes, discovering patterns, changing the business, and then asking those questions again. So it becomes a virtuous circle for, for management. They're getting value in, in terms of how that goes forward. Um, and your data's getting better, and you're discovering patterns you didn't know exist existed at the uh, at the start. So to sort of finish up, I hope this session has given you some ideas about why it's important and how you can use business intelligence to empower your users to change the way they make business decisions to make better data-driven business decisions in your organizations. So thank you very much.